I'm Shay Garrison. I want to tell you the truth about socialism. It's particularly important right now during this worldwide crisis. Well, what does coronavirus have to do with socialism, you may ask? Well, it is highlighting how different types of governments respond to a crisis. We see that as Bernie Sanders has risen in prominence in the Democratic Party, that socialism in our country has resurged in mainstream American politics and policy. But here's the question. Right now, would the U.S. be better off with socialism? Let me answer that for you. Heritage Foundation has an annual index of economic freedom, and it gives timely insight into the effect of how an economic structure affects a health crisis like COVID-19 that we're currently in the middle of. So check out this chart that was published in the Daily Signal from Heritage Foundation. Dr. Anthony Kim found that fundamentally a nation's capacity to handle pandemics hinges on the quality of their institutions and their economic systems particularly given that there are positive links between economic freedom and health security capacity. So you'll see that again in the chart. Again, as the economic freedom of a country rises, their global health security or their capacity to, to take care of themselves during a health crisis also increases. Dr. Kim goes on to say that the link between economic freedom and human well-being is undeniable. People in economically free societies live longer, have better health, and take better care of the environment. They also tend to have greater capacity to counter infectious diseases that know no borders, such as the current coronavirus pandemic that we're experiencing today. So let's talk about why this is. Socialism inherently, perhaps not always intentionally, diminishes the value of human beings. It diminishes their achievements, their innovation, their productivity, and ultimately their freedom. Countries that have a limited government and free market principles, such as the principles the US was based on, create a foundation of economic freedom. Milton Friedman pointed out that increases in economic freedom have gone hand in hand with increases in political and civil freedom. And not only that, they have led to increased prosperity and well-being. That's what the history has shown. So what do we ultimately mean by socialism in a country? Well, the main goals of socialism have shifted somewhat over the past century, but ultimately, socialism always centers around two main things. Placing more control in the hands of government and less in the hands of its citizens. And second, socialism focuses on a government-led and enforced extreme redistribution of income among its citizens. Let's look at the history, though, of socialism and its track record. Sounds great, doesn't really work. Almost a hundred years have passed since we had that first planned socialist economy. And since then, the world has had ample time to see over and over the dangerous and foolhardy results of socialism and its policies. Just think about highly socialist countries throughout history of the 1900s, China, the Soviet Union and Cuba, they all focused on nationalizing the main segments of their economy. What that means is that the state took over the main means of production for the country. This was in agriculture, manufacturing, and other industries, all owned and run by the government instead of private citizens and companies. In fact, if you look at the role of private businesses, Hayek pointed out that the abolition of private enterprise, of private ownership of the means of production, and then the creation of a system that 
uh, ran this planned economy, those were the main attributes of, of these time periods in socialistic countries. The entrepreneur that previously was working for profit is replaced by the central planning body. What we see, though, as the history of those countries runs forward is declines in output after they turn to socialism, especially in the industries that were taken over by the state. Agricultural countries whose private farms, for example, were forced into state ownership, they were actually meant to produce more food with fewer workers so that the resources could be shifted into other industries. But that's not what happened. Let me give you a couple of examples. The first country to create a new economic system based on the tenets of Marx socialism was the Soviet Union. We saw that in 1910, the Russian Empire was actually the world's largest expo exporter of grain and other agricultural products. But at the end of 1917, as we know, Russia turned to Lenin and to socialism. Long story short, Stalin succeeded Lenin in the mid-1920s and instituted a planned economy shortly thereafter. A planned economy basically means that the government is telling you what job you will perform and dictates every aspect of the market, including, in, in this case, where you live, where you buy your products, where you go to school, and it goes on. The result of reliance on central planning rather than on market mechanisms at that time was that millions of its own people ended up dying from starvation. Similarly, we see about 30 million people starved to death after Mao Zedong switched China to a planned economy. Now there's so much more about that history. If you want to know more about the history and the details and ins and outs, go on our website and get our book, The Truth About Socialism. But I want to switch to this. What does this mean for us today? Countries today generally have less extreme forms of socialism. So what do they focus on? Mainly government control and extensive redistribution of individual incomes through taxation and through social welfare systems. Ultimate outcome, and we can talk on and on about the different attributes that are not healthy for citizens, but ultimately they also generate less output, although in the short term it's not nearly as drastic as with the highly socialist countries. However, here's the point. Many studies that compare economic freedom of various countries with their economic strength show this, that freer countries are economically better off all the time. We also see this again in the Heritage Foundation chart we discussed in the beginning of our lesson that shows the correlation between economic freedom and better health read readiness and outcomes. So what does this mean for us, for the United States, for our politics going forward? For example, what about universal health care? Wouldn't universal health care help people who struggle to pay for medical bills and health insurance? And there are many people that do. Some have proposed universal health care or Medicare for all as a means to nationalize, otherwise known as socialize, the U.S. healthcare system and give free health care to citizens. Again, sounds good, doesn't work. Here's the rub. Free stuff, it's never really free. It requires incredibly high tax rates for support. Generally, the people that carry the burden of that are the middle and lower income uh, wage earners. Studies on the productivity and effectiveness of single-payer systems suggest that Medicare for All would actually reduce longevity, health, and here's the thing, particularly among our seniors. And at the same time, it only slightly increases the number of people with health insurance. And here's another startling fact. Our country's debt is currently over 22 trillion dollars. Yes, I said trillion. 
the Medicare for All plan, as outlined by Senator Bernie Sanders, would cost us an estimated 32 to $38 trillion. It seems totally unimaginable that anyone would take a plan with this kind of cost seriously. Somebody has to pay that 30 plus trillion dollars and that somebody would be you. A fully funded health program as envisioned by Bernie Sanders would end up being more expensive for 71% of the nation's working families, including the low income families. What they don't tell you is that 75% of Americans are actually satisfied with their current private health plans. And close to 91% of Americans do have health insurance today. Now the US health system uh, makes up about one sixth of the economy. Should we blow up one sixth of the US economy and reset everyone's health insurance? I think it's the wrong approach. To date, the Democrats have offered no serious idea or plan as to how they want to pay for this type of health care system. Instead, we need to look for targeted solutions for those 9% of Americans who are not covered. We'll talk about that more later in other lessons. But I want to really drive this point home. Here are some examples of problems with universal health care systems. In 2017, Canadians waited an average of four and a half months to a year for basic hip, knee, ankle, and shoulder surgeries. As a result, over 63,000 Canadians sought non-emergency medical treatments outside of Canada last year. And in the British National Health Service, cancellations by the health care provider are pretty common. Last year alone, nearly 80,000 elective surgeries were canceled the day of the surgery without medical justification. So much for health care for all. There are other timely topics on socialism that you can read about in our book, The Truth About Socialism. I want to just say this though. What does the Bible say about socialism? Should we take care of the poor or those in need? Of course we should. The Bible says that if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, it says, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. When Jesus or the Bible talks about caring for the poor, they're referring to us as individuals or the church and that we should willingly open our hearts to care for others that are in real need. It's not referring to the government coercing citizens into giving up large amounts of their own income for the government to redistribute it as it sees fit. Paul even said, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So let's recap what we've discussed today. Socialism may sound great, and boy do they try to make it sound great, but it doesn't work. Bottom line is that nothing is free, somebody has to pay for it. And yes, we should care for the poor and needy. But the government by itself does not do that well. Economic freedom is the best bet for society. We see that today where freer countries have better health outcomes. And I want to leave you with this thought. Free market systems recognize the intrinsic value and the unique contributions of every individual. But socialism, on the other hand, diminishes the value of human beings, their achievements, and their freedoms. We'll talk more about that in depth in another lesson, or you can also get our book online, The Truth About Social Socialism. So thank you for joining me today. I would love to know what you think about the lesson, and I'd love to answer any questions that you may have. Comment with your questions below, and we will answer some of those questions in our next video and other lessons on socialism.